Well, I don't expect you to remember, but in 2021, I uh, did an extensive study on 1 Corinthians, the book in the Bible called 1 Corinthians. In fact, I preached over 20 uh, different sermons and three different series from 1 Corinthians. Uh, And today, I want to start for a fall series, basically to lead us up to Christmas time. I want to study 2 Corinthians. Now, there's 27 books in the New Testament. Paul wrote 13 of them. And 2 Corinthians is by far his most personal writing. In 2 Corinthians, in a sense, he pulls back the curtain of his own life, his own ministry, his own struggles, and he lets the believers in the church at Corinth see that, and now we can look at it and study it as well. 2 Corinthians deals with such subjects as weakness, grief, peril, comfort, boasting, truth, ministry, and glory. 2 Corinthians actually encourages believers to embrace and follow the way of Jesus' transforming power. And it does that by emphasizing three things overall in the book that Jesus' transforming power will do. It will affect our generosity, it will affect our humility, and get this one, it will affect us in weakness. Now, we don't necessarily understand right off the bat why God would allow weakness to strengthen us, but 2 Corinthians really deals with that aspect a lot. In fact, the reoccurring theme in this second letter we call 2 Corinthians is that God is sufficient when I am at my weakest. So if you walked in here today with any trouble at all, now maybe you're one of the few people that right now in your life everything's going smooth, and that's good, that's great, enjoy the season. But most of us have something that we might be struggling with. If that's the case, then the book of 2 Corinthians is for you. It teaches that the sufficiency of God demonstrates itself greatest when we are at our weakest point. It's in his power rather than my strength that God allows me and empowers me to endure, but not only endure, triumph as a Christian. In the very first full paragraph in 2 Corinthians, it jumps right into the matter. Now, in a couple of Wednesday nights from now, I'm going to introduce the background of 2 Corinthians in a Wednesday night study. That's verses 1 and 2. But today, we're going to jump in to verse 3 and to kind of serve as an illustration for what uh, verses 3 and following is about. I've asked Brother Clyde Self, did I, you got the mic? You got the mic. Thank you. I've asked Brother Clyde Self to come, and he's really going to tell us about a ministry that does this paragraph. So he's going to talk a few minutes about a ministry we do in our church that actually does this paragraph that we're going to study. The last song the praise team did uh, was really a good, uh, a strong message of what Grief Share tries to communicate. Um, I told the early service that, you know, there's a, a number of people in this room right now that are more qualified than me to speak about grief and how much uh, grief share has helped them. Uh, but it's a, it's a d- difficult topic to, uh, to talk about. Um, in grief share, you'll hear you know, that uh, some describe grief as traumatic. Um, devastating. That it shakes, your, shakes you to your foundation. And, and it really does. Um, you need to make sure your foundation is strong. Uh, and that's what grace here helps you to do. Uh, Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 and 10 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. 
you know, grief is labor, it's work. If you've ever experienced uh, hard grief, it really is. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity any who falls down and, no one, and has no one to help them up. So one of the benefits of grief share is to having uh, a group of people that's willing to listen, number one, and two, to help you understand the grief process. Uh, grief is different for, for everyone. The intensity of it, the, um, the emotions, the duration. Uh, some describe grief as, you know, you know I, th I think I'm going crazy. Uh, I don't know what to do next. Uh, even daily, um, regular daily activities, some have a, a struggle getting through that. They ask the question, it, it So am I, am I going crazy? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, some imagine that uh, they, they even see their loved ones. Some forget things they've learned. Um, it addresses this question of why. And the other you know, truth is that uh, the day we're born, all of our days are numbered from the, from the day we're born. So grief share helps answer the question why and, and shows us what the Bible's got to say about that. It helps us with guilt and anger. Maybe uh, when your loved one passed away that the, the, the relationship was strained. Uh, maybe it wasn't good. Well, grief share helps us to deal with that. And, and from a guilt standpoint, um, you know, many of you knew my mom. Uh, she passed away in 2012, a faithful member of this church. Um, she had been battling lymphoma. She was getting better. Uh, you know, we were up there. She was in intensive care. Um, we were there late. Uh, I was struggling with whether or not to stay up there with her or go home. And she insisted that we go home, so we did. And... Uh, Next day, I got a call from my dad saying, your mama's taking a turn for the worse. You need to get up here. And by that night, she was gone. And so I've wondered, you know, what if, if I had stayed, would it have made a difference? And uh, I still ask that question. Um, so grief share helps us to deal with that. The effects of grief share and relationships. Sometimes people around you will tell you, you need to get over it, you need to move on. Well, grief doesn't work like that. Uh, grief is a process, it's a, it's a healing process. Uh, you don't get over a, se a severe wound uh, rapidly. Uh, it's a healing process. So it helps you to respond to people that are insisting that you uh, get over that grief. It actually gives you permission to grieve. There's community in grief share. You know, after the funeral, Many people start to go back to their daily routines. They've got jobs. They've got families of their own. Grief Share is a community of people that's interested in hearing what you've got to say, interested in helping you with your grief. Uh, those of you that have been through grief know that it's, it's, it's very personal. Uh, grief Share is a safe place where you can share what you're feeling. It's a 13-week process that continuously point you toward God. It helps, helps you to rely on God. And sometimes when you're, you know, lying in bed at night, nobody's there, but it helps you to remember that God is there with you and he wants, to, he wants you to uh, cry out to him and to hang on to him. So just in terms of, of wrapping up, I would say that uh, Grief Share points us to God. His Word helps you to cultivate your relationship with God. And by the end of that 13-week week process, hopefully you've got a, um, a routine in your life, your prayer life, your walk with God, that you can sustain that. But we've got some people that come back two and three times to participate in that ministry. 
God wasn't surprised by your loss. He cares about you. He wants to, uh, you to fellowship with him and know him better through that uh, healing process. Thank you. So Grief Share, the ministry that we have, actually lives out the verses we're going to study today. So that's why I wanted you to hear that uh, from Clyde. So now let's look at the passage. There are four things I want us to see in the paragraph that we're going to study. The first one is this, God is a comforting God. So I just want to put that out there to begin with. God is a comforting God. So Paul is just getting into this, this, this new book called 2 Corinthians, his, his new letter to the Corinthians. And the, the first letter... The, the church was in conflict. That's what 1 Corinthians is all about. It's about struggle. It's about conflict. They're just a sorry church. That's what they are. And that's what 1 Corinthians is about. 2 Corinthians, they've got new problems, but it's the same God. And so that's what we're going to look at for the next several weeks. So let's look at first, God is a comforting God, verses 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our afflictions. Now, let me just point out three things pretty quick in those couple of phrases. One, God comforts. So let's talk about that word comfort. The word comfort in the Greek word, in the Greek language, the word is parakletos. That's the Greek word, and I'm not saying that to try to impress you with my Greek knowledge. You know the only Greek I know is I ate at a Greek restaurant once, and that's it. But actually, I'm going to show you the meaning of that word, and it'll make sense in a minute. That word parakletos means the act of exhortation or the act of encouragement. It is to comfort someone. It's the encouragement that strengthens or helps establish someone who has fallen. It is a believer that can come alongside another that has fallen or stumbled and they need someone to lift them up. That's that word parakletos. In Greek literature, it was used as a term to describe a legal advisor, like a, a, a law counselor. It was used for someone who would plead your case or someone who was your proxy or someone who was your advocate. It was someone who represented you when you needed to be represented. That's the term paracletus. But the, the, the way you know it, you don't know that you know it, but the reason why you know this word is because it is the word that Jesus uses in John 14 to describe the third person of the Trinity. He's introducing to his disciples this concept of the Holy Spirit. And he describes the Holy Spirit as the comforter. And so that's the word Jesus uses to describe what the Holy Spirit's going to do. One of the things the Holy Spirit's going to do is he's going to be the comforter. And then in 1 John, written by the same guy who wrote John 14, in 1 John 2, 1, Christ is termed as the substitutionary, the intercessory, the advocate, that same concept. And so what we have is we've got God the Father in this verse that is described as the comforter. We got in John chapter 14, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is called the comforter. And then in 1 John 4, you've got Jesus is the comforter. So all that God is in his complete triune uh, a person is the comforter. Now, that's not the only thing God is. I also understand that God is holy, and he's just, and he's righteous, and he's going to judge. I understand that, but he also is comforter. And so, that's the first thing we need to understand here, is that God comforts. The second thing about this first major point, found in verse 3, is God comforts. His comfort comes out of his mercy. So look at verse 3. Notice that word mercy in verse 3. The word mercy means to have pity or compassion on someone who is suffering. Here it's used in reference to God as the Father out of his characteristic of mercy is showing comfort and pity to us as we need it. Paul uses the same word in, in Philippians and Colossians of believers who show compassion to each other. So we can have mercy and compassion for each other. Third thing in this first point here in verse 4 
is God comforts us in all our afflictions. Notice that in verse four, the first phrase says, he comforts us in all our afflictions. Now, I wish that I could break down and show you the Greek meaning of the word all, but it's pretty simple. It just means all. It just means all. It doesn't matter what struggle, trouble, conflict, either imposed on you because we live in a fallen, sinful, decaying world, or something you did to yourself, or something somebody else did to you. God is available to comfort all troubles. That's what that word all means. But a, a, a more important word I want you to see there in verse four is a pronoun. It says, he comforts us in all our afflictions. Now I want you to get that. If you write in your Bible, circle that word our. So this is not about me saying, oh, I feel sorry for Heath because he's got problems. Or I feel sorry for Dwayne because he's going through a hard time. No, this is about I've got problems. See, the first part of accepting God's comfort is you have to admit you've got problems and you need God's help. It's not always seeing somebody else's problems and say, oh, poor them. I just feel so sorry for them. We're the ones. We need to be honest with ourselves. We're the ones. So that's the first thing I want to see is that God is a comforting God. Second thing I want you to see is that God comforts us not only for our benefit, but so we might comfort others as well. Now, let me read verses four through seven. These verses are kind of choppy, so, but I think when I spend some time on them, you'll understand it. So in verse four, it says he comforts us in all, all of our affliction. Then it says, so that, now, so that is what's called a purpose clause. It's a very little important trick that's used in, in Greek writing. It, a purpose clause means what I just got through saying, here's the purpose for it. So let's reread verse four. Look, look at it carefully. Verse four says, he comforts us in all of our affliction. So this is why he's comfort, comforting us. So that, here's the purpose, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Verse five, for just as the suffering of Christ overflowed to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering that we suffer. And our hope, for you is firm because we know that as you share in the sufferings, so you will also share in the comfort. Now, I told you those were kind of wordy, but let me break it down. I think I can explain it with three sub points real quick. First, th this, verse four. God intends our received comfort to be used to help others. We get short-sighted in our comfort we think the only reason why we're being ministered to or comforted is to make us feel better. No. It is so that when we are comforted, we can comfort somebody else. Rick Warren had a saying, and I know some people, and there's some things about Rick Warren that you know, none of us agree with, but he's got some good stuff out there too. He had a saying years ago that I really liked. He said, God never wastes a hurt. So if you've had a struggle, if you've had a hurt, if you'd had a challenge, if you had a tribulation, if you had a difficult time, God doesn't waste that. So when he ministers to you and comforts you, he does that so you can turn around and help somebody else. Have you lost a loved one? God will use that for you to help somebody else. Have you had a tragic accident that kind of reset your life? God can use that to help somebody else. Have you had a, had a failed marriage? God can use that to help somebody else. Any crisis, even if it's inflicted by society, or inflicted by you, or just inflicted because we live in a fallen world, God can use that as he comforts you to comfort others. Second sub point here in verse five, God dispenses both Christ's suffering and Christ's comfort to believers. Look at verse five. God, uh, uh, 
Christ's suffering comes from the cross. And because of the cross, we as Christians are actually called to die to self. Now, we don't like that concept, but that's what Christianity is. Christianity is not getting a ticket to heaven. Christianity is dying to self so that Christ can live in my life. Christ suffered on the cross, so I'm gonna join that suffering. In fact, Paul says in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. So it's like me climbing up on the cross. I gotta crucify my desires and die with Christ. And if I do that, then I get to enjoy the comfort of Christ. And the comfort of Christ was that he was raised from the dead. 40 days later, he ascended up into heaven. He's in the presence of God in heaven. Now he is the second person of the Trinity in heaven right now. There is no pain. There is no worry. There is no concern. He's full in full comfort. I can look forward to that. If I suffer with him and die to self on the cross with him, then I can experience his comfort. Third thing, verses six and seven, God often uses others to comfort us during times of trial. God comforts us through others, halfway through verse six, to produce patient endurance. Now you look at that verse six when it says, uh, halfway through, which produces in you patient endurance endurance. Now, if they let me write the Bible, I'm going to take that word patient endurance out. I'm just going to take that out. I don't like either one of those, okay? But they don't let me write the Bible. I don't want to be patient, and I don't want to endure anything. I want everything to go smooth. But the truth is, life it doesn't always go smooth. The truth is, if you have been on this earth very long, you know you got to have patient endurance. It's just the way it is. But I want to show you a word that precedes that, that really encourages me. If you look at verse 6, that halfway through that verse 6, it says, which produces in you patient endurance. Now, that word produce, if I were to put that Greek word produce on the screen, you would know what it is. It's that obvious. We get the word energize from it. So get this. God energizes me, pr pr produces patient endurance because of trials. He plugs me in to himself so that I have power to endure. When I think my tank is empty, God fills it up with gas so that I can go towards pac patient endurance. So if you are at the end of your rope, you're about ready to give up, you don't know if you can make it another day, God produces, he energizes, he fills your tank, he plugs you in to his power source, and you will patiently endure. So God intends our received comfort to be used to help others. God dispenses both Christ's suffering and comfort to others. And God often uses others to comfort us during our times of trials. Third big thing to look at, because God comforts, we can be honest about our struggles. So let's go to verses 8 and 9. Verse 8 says this, We don't want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction that took place in Asia. We were completely overwhelmed beyond our strength so that we even despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. So this third thing I want you to see is that because God comforts, we can be honest about our struggles. Now, let's look at a few words here to help us understand. The word affliction uh, in the Christian standard, that's how it's translated. It means crushed or pressed to compress or squeeze down. We would use the expression between a rock and a hard place. That, that's what it means. It means when life has squeezed you down and you feel like you don't have any options, you're between a rock and a hard place, you don't have any good choices, it's just really that hard, that's the word afflicted here. 
Most English Bibles translate it tribulation, trouble, or affliction. Now, there are various occasions in the Bible that talk about affliction and what, why we might have affliction. Let me just give you some of the examples. Stephen preached a sermon in Acts chapter 7. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. He preached a sermon and they killed him. I do not recommend that you follow that pattern today. Okay. But in that sermon, he said that Joseph, who was uh, sold by his brothers into slavery, eventually ended up in prison in Egypt. None of it was his fault. It was all someone else doing something to him. Well, Acts says that was affliction. It uses that word affliction. So it was something that somebody else did to him. He didn't deserve it. In the next verse in that sermon, uh, Stephen says that when the famine, the drought came and there was no food in Egypt and for uh, Joseph's family, that that was a distressful time. That was a time of trouble as well. And this was a natural disaster. It wasn't anybody's fault. It was just a natural disaster. And that was tribulation or, or uh, conflict or, or, or trials. At least part of the struggle that the Corinthians were experiencing, we'll see it in chapter 8, was that they had the wrong attitude about money. It was something they were doing. It was their sin, their wrong attitude that was causing the affliction in their life. In James 1, verse 27, it refers to uh, orphans and widows as being in a uh, struggle, in affliction. So you've got things that are caused by other people on us. You've got things that are natural disaster that's just nobody's fault. It's just natural disaster. You've got things you do to yourself, I do to myself. And then you've got things that it's not in our control, it's out of our control. Maybe family situations, a family member dies, uh, you're, you're left without a father, you're left without a, a spouse, and just things that, that happen in that regard. All those are listed in the Bible, plus many more, that are described as afflictions. Now, let me show you three things now that I've kind of introduced that concept here about how be, we can be honest about our struggles. First, in verse 8, it's appropriate to speak of our difficulties. Now, I want you to read verse 8. It says, we, Paul's referring to himself, uh, and then Timothy, who's uh, kind of with him in this ministry, he says, we don't want you to be unaware, brethren, and then you could include sisters in that as well, of our affliction that took place in Asia. My generation and older, so basically me in this room, uh, my generation and older, uh, we learn from our parents, our dads, Ben, I'm talking to you for a little bit. Our dads didn't have problems. If they had a problem, we, never, we, didn't, we didn't know about it. They didn't say anything about it. They dealt with it. I don't know if they had problems or not. They just lowered their head and they dealt with it. Who knows if they had problems or not? That's just the way we were raised. So that's kind of the way I was raised. You just don't have problems. And we feel like that's what, how men are supposed to respond, and that's the tough thing that men are supposed to be. If you ever study Paul, the character of Paul, Paul was a badder dude than anybody in this room. There's not a man in this room as tough as Paul was. You study. You study how many times he was beaten. You study how many times he was thrown in jail. You study how many times he was stoned. They left him dead one time. They thought they'd stoned him to death. There's not a man in this room as tough as Paul. And Paul says, I don't want you to be unaware. Man, we have some serious trouble in Asia. Now, if Paul can say that, men... In this room, we can say that. Now, I'm not saying we need to bellyache about every problem. That's not what I'm saying. But we have real issues. And it's okay when we are struggling to say to somebody, I'm struggling. I mean, I got this going on in my life. I, 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 I could use some encouragement. I mean, if Paul said it, we ought to be able to say it. So first, it's appropriate to speak about our difficulties. 
Secondly, found in the second part of verse 8, struggles often overwhelm us to the point of despair. Notice what he says in verse 8. He talks about these afflictions that took place in Asia. So he has a particular thing in mind. He doesn't tell us, but he's got a particular incident in mind that happened in Asia. And then he says, we were completely overwhelmed. That word completely is the word hyper. He says, we were hyper overwhelmed. We were hyper distressed. We were hyper in in stress. And so in chapter one, verse eight, he says, man, my trouble, my problems are hyper. Maybe you feel that way today. Your troubles are extreme. They're hyper. But then in chapter four, verse seven, he talks about the hyper greatness of God's character. In chapter 4, verse 17, he talks about the hyper-greatness of God's glory. In chapter 12, verse 7, he talks about the hyper-greatness of God's revelation. So he starts out in chapter 1, he says, man, we're under hyper-problems. I've been through it in Asia. It was terrible. thought I was going to die. It was bad. But through the rest of the book, he starts talking about the hyper-greatness of God in these different ways. That leads me to the third thing under this point three. In verse 9, struggles can lead us to feel we're going to die. I mean, that's, that's what he says in verse, uh, in verse 9, the first phrase. He says, indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. He says, man, I, I thought I was going to die. Now, it hadn't happened very many times, but there have been times I didn't know if I was going to make it. There have been those times. Not very many. Some of you may can identify, you know. You are so heartbroken, you just don't know if you're going to make it. Well, you're in good company. The greatest missionary ever says, I felt the same thing. Something specific happened. We don't know what it was. He gave a specific location. He said, it was so bad, I didn't think I was going to make it. So if you don't think there's a way out, God has squeezed you down right where he wants you. So you got to turn to him, which is the fourth big thing to look at. God uses the struggles of life to bring spiritual growth to the believers. So let me read verses 9 through 11. Again, they're somewhat wordy, but I think I can uh, explain them as we work our way through. Verse 9 again says, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, so that, there's that purpose clause again, so the reason why He's to the point that he thinks he's not going to make it. He thinks he's going to die so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead. He, God, has, past tense, delivered us from such a terrible death, and he will, present tense, deliver us. We have put our hope in him that he will, future tense, deliver us again. While you join in helping us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gift that came to us through the prayers of many. So let me show you three ways God grows us through struggles. One, believers will more fully rely on God. Now, I tried to emphasize it when I read it. Paul uses past tense, present tense, and future tense. Come to church, you'll learn learn a little English, okay? Past tense, he says, God has been faithful. He's brought me through struggles in the past. Present tense, he is currently bringing me through struggles. Future tense, I don't know what the future is going to hold, but I know God is going to bring me through it. If God has ever brought you through a challenging time, that is proof that he can bring you through the situation you're in right now. And he will in the future, whatever that is, bring you through that situation too. That's the type of God he is. He is a faithful God. We frequently need a good dose of helplessness when we are reduced to extremes, when we're stripped of all of our self-confidence, and then we can learn in humility the power of God. 
As long as there's something in me that thinks I can do it on my own, I'm not at the point that God can come in and do it. Paul's hyper struggle in that he sees God's hyper sufficiency. So first, believers will fully rely on God. Second way, second way he grows us, verse 11, believers will have more focused prayers for others. So he's actually encouraging them to pray for him, and then in the next phrase, he's going to thank them for doing that. Don't raise your hand. Have you ever had, so you come up to somebody and you say, you know, I know it's a tough time. Is there anything I can do for you? And, and they say, well, just pray for me. And then you said, okay. And then you forgot and didn't pray. I mean, we do it all the time, don't we? I, I, I've, I've tried to start because of... Uh, Short-term memory loss. I've, I've tried to just pray right then with them if I can. If the setting is at all available, I mean, if there's any way possible, I just say, would well, you mind if I pray right now for you? Praying for somebody when they say, well, all you can do is just pray for me, you need to take that seriously and pray right then for them. Or it, as soon as you can. It, it, it is a disservice to that person and to the gift God has given us when someone says, would you pray for me, or they open up that door for prayer and we not pray as believers for them. So that's how he spiritually grows us because sometimes you wonder, well, I'd pray for so-and-so, but I don't know how to pray for him. If they just told you, hey, this is going on, or you've heard this is going on, you've got a focused way to, to pray for him. So first, we're going to rely on God more. Secondly, we're going to have a focused way to pray for someone who's going through a struggle. And then thirdly, Believers will be more thankful for others. So that's the last part of verse 11. He talks about how he's going to be thankful. So when I share a part of who I am in a struggle, and you say, well, I'll pray for you, and you actually do it, guess what? I become thankful to God, but I become thankful to you. I appreciate you. And it's, and it's true with everybody in the room. When you come to me and you say something and I pray for you, you become more appreciative of me. It builds a more thankful heart. And a thankful heart is less prone to depression and discouragement and all these things that Satan wants us to go into. So as Jimmy makes his way to the front, I want to just kind of ask some things and see if anything hits home with you. I want you to listen. The service isn't over. Pay attention. Are you struggling this morning, did you receive bad news from the doctor about a family member or about yourself? Are you in a job that the only reason why you're in it is because you got to have the health insurance? You hate it, but you got to have the health insurance. Are you struggling with aging parents, taking care of aging parents? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? You just feel like you just can't get over stuff. Are you in a marriage that's a constant battle? Do you have a teenager that you just don't know what to do? You just don't know what to do with them. Are you fearful about your grades? You're afraid that if you don't make a certain ACT score that you're not going to be able to get the things that you think you need to have. In any of these things, have you gotten to the point that you're ready to say, I'm at the bottom? I'm going to lose myself and surrender to the comfort of God because I can't do it. God cannot help until we get to that point. Second, different angle of questions. Are you not going through any of those things? And right now you're in a great season in your life. And those great seasons do come, praise the Lord. And so many in this room are in a great season in your life. Are you intentionally praying for someone who's not in a good season? I mean, you're bound to know somebody that's not in a good season in their life right now. They are struggling. Why are you not intentionally praying for them? 
We are invited by God to do so. It's an obligation that we have by God to do so. So here in a minute, we're going to sing a song as we do each Sunday. I'm going to ask you to do something a little different. I'm going to ask you, if you can, physically, I'm going to ask you to come to the front and kneel down and pray. Or if you can kneel down where you're at, it's kind of tight. I want you to kneel down and pray for one of two things. One, to surrender your struggle, if, if it's you today, to give that up to God. Or secondly, if things are going pretty good for you, take the next few minutes to pray for somebody that is struggling. Let's pray. The one that's going to be baptized can slip out and prepare for that, and Mike, you can join him. God, I pray that I would allow you to comfort me, and Lord, I pray also that each person in this room would allow you to comfort them as well. And God, for those of us that are in a good place right now, I pray, Lord, that we would see the need, the urgency to pray for others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.